Uh, there's two things uh, I have to say, first of all, one of which is not to stand uh, where the uh, projector blinds you. Um, one is that there are copies of the book for you all, and if you haven't collected them, or indeed you don't want them, but nevertheless there are some at the back there afterwards on your way out. The second is that this is about uh, principally government in the UK, right? But uh, it also applies to every government in the world, essentially. That may be quite a big statement. Uh, I have been around the world quite a lot, but not to every country. But the way in which it will apply will be different. But nevertheless, the systems of government that we have, and it's the system here that I'm talking about, not the politics, the, the system of government that's put forward here will apply everywhere. So my apologies if it seems a little parochial. Uh, it's about the UK. But I think you'll see, as you go through, you can be considering your own circumstances as to how uh, that might apply. So, well, what can... Uh, a government uh, a management consultant uh, teach a minister and appreciating your project and again there are aspects of the way in which you try to get governments to work are similar to the way in which you want to get a not-for-profit or a charity to work because they're both operating in an environment where there isn't a market, essentially, where there aren't the competitive pressures to drive performance. So some of the things that you'll find in here will be relevant to your current project. However, <laughs> many of you will be going into business, and a friend of mine who's uh, worked for a company, the name of which you'll know if I told you, but I'm sorry, I can't tell you, uh, read the book, and he said this, hearty congratulations on a wonderful book. I'm trying to run my company in the way in which uh, you've set out your book. So he sort of uses it as a handbook. Although it's about government, he uses it as a handbook for how he runs his company. And secondly, he uses it for personal development. Because there's a lot in there about the motivation, the management of people the way in which systems work and the way in which organisations work. So I hope that this is very relevant uh, to your studies and very relevant to your careers. Um, my route to understanding, uh, these are the experiences that I've brought to bear in order to uh, get to grips with government. So, on your left-hand side, I have four business, business schools, including uh, this one. Um, uh, I've done work for the Labour Party, which is one of the principal parties, political parties in this country. When it, the last time it was in a mess, uh, and I sorted out the organisation. I've been a government advisor um, to a series of ministers. Um, again, perhaps relevant to your current work, RELATE is the National Relationship uh, Counselling Charity. DEMOS is a think tank. Um, I've worked on uh, public sector reform as a consultant, both Thatcher's and Blair's, and I've worked uh, in a number of companies when I was head of entertainment and media. Um, at the top there, did my consultancy role. I also ended up on the global board of PwC, at the time when Coopers and Lybrand and Pricewaterhouse were merging. Um, I spent a reasonable amount of time being collected in very large black limousines, having travelled uh, indeed on Concord at times, uh, going to siege gun board meetings in large rooms in the basements of New York hotels. Apparently this is something you may aspire to, um, so, if you've uh, been to Manchester Business School, uh, this is perhaps uh, a route you might follow. All of those experiences I brought to bear in terms of analysing government. But also, all of those experiences led to frustration. I don't know about you, but I'm personally extremely frustrated with the way government works. Just as a citizen or a consumer, and my experiences of the way I interact whether it's getting on a train, 
whether it's filling in a form, whether it's looking at the way schools work, um, what, whether it looks the way Parliament works, I get frustrated. So I stopped being a management consultant, so I thought I'd write a book. And I started off with an analysis from a business school perspective of why the Labour Party lost the 2010 general election, where you're choosing the government, essentially. And that was great. I took it to a publisher and an agent, and they said, well, that's fine, but it's too narrow. So why didn't you work on why governments fail in general? So off I went, did more analysis, uh, and as the sorts of things we'll come on to. And he says, well, that's fine, but what about a solution? You know, everyone's got critiques, everyone's got uh, knocking copy for governments, what about a solution? Um, so I went off and produced a solution, which we'll come on to. And I'll take you through that now. The other thing I wanted to stress is that I'm not looking at this from the point of view of politics. I'm looking at this as an organisation specialist. Um, I'm applying the tools that you learnt, are learning here. And these are the sort of tools, um, which I hope you're learning here anyway, I found them incredibly useful and I've applied a vast tool bag of stuff from my MBA. Um, from alignment, integrated supply chains, consumer strategy, actually just basic sound accounting, all of these things are relevant to government. And these are the, some of the books that have influenced me. Um, I'd highly recommend, particularly am amusing as well, The Psychology of Military Incompetence, Why People Cock Things Up in Wars, might be another title. Um, the Sickness of Government, written by possibly the father of uh, management education, Peter Drucker, in 1969, and so on. So all of those things are in there, in here, rather. OK, so what happened? Why did Labour lose the 2010 election? I went through um, hundreds of interviews with a whole range of people and I identified these 19 causes. So let's pick out one. They went into the election with a man called Gordon Brown and it was very obvious that he was a leader, although he was Prime Minister, he just wasn't going to win. So you then say to yourself, if you're getting to the root cause and you ask the five whys, well, why on earth would a political party go into an election with someone who's not going to win? And you then find that actually the rules underlying the way in which the Labour Party changed their leader are weak. You then find that the culture within the Labour Party uh, for challenging an incumbent is weak and you actually then find the way that they get into the infighting as to who should be the next leader is rather like FIFA picking the next World Cup venue. Okay? And if you're familiar with that, you'll know that is not a good process. If you take another one, so governments do this a lot, legislation laws as the agent of change. So why was it over-reliant on legislation? Partly because of habit, that's what governments do. Partly because of ego, passing laws feels important. Partly because of media and public pressure of the type, you've probably seen it. Something goes wrong, a child gets killed, it must never happen again. And so, what does the government do? It passes a law, and the media go quiet. Of course, it always does happen again. Partly it's because governments want to feel they're doing something. Uh, we all want to feel they're doing something, and legislation gives the impression of action. Partly because the alternative means to achieve change are harder. So we have a litter act in this country. Uh, in Australia, they had a public education campaign to stop littering. Australia has been pretty successful, um, we've not so. But finally, and this is the crucial point, the effectiveness and cost and benefits of legislation are never collected. So you push laws out into the world and you then never go back and check 
how those laws are working. There is an absence of feedback. Right, onward. So you look at all of those causes, those 19 causes, and then you step back and get underneath those causes, and these are at the roots of them. Alignment I'll come on to in a minute. If you have slack rules in any organisation, you'll have slack behaviour, and that's what we get. There's this thing called political authority, which is something that we bestow on our politicians when we elect them, and we give them our political authority to go and make decisions. But the crucial thing is, which bit of our authority do we give to which part of the system of government? You find politics in the wrong places and not on the right. There are limited controls on policy making. All of these things I'll come back to. And as I said, there's no systematic feedback. Believe it or not, in our constitutions, there is no requirement for the effective delivery of services. You may say, well, politically there is. But actually, in terms of the definition of the system of government, there is no requirement. So I moved on from why Labour lost to looking at government more generally in the round. And there's a thing, I guess you'll all probably all have things like national audit offices. Uh, and they've been writing reports on weapons procurement. This is procurement of big guns, ships, aircraft carriers and so on. And I couldn't help but notice that the reports they're writing today essentially say it's way over budget, it's way late, and it doesn't meet the specification. The Chinook helicopters you may be familiar with, but it was a fantastic fiasco which came out in 2011. Those reports were exactly the same in the 60s and 70s. So weapons procurement hasn't improved. But what ministers have done is to say, OK, right, that section of the Ministry of Defence isn't working. So why, OK, let's appoint a head. We'll appoint a man. Not yet a woman, usually a man. So we'll appoint a man, and then it still doesn't get better. And then you say, well, OK, but you've appointed a man into an organisation where that person has no control over the employment of those people because they're all civil servants. It has no control over their promotion, no control over their recruitment, no control <laughs> over their pay. So I'm a civil servant in the Ministry of Defence. Why would I listen to this man that's come in? I can just sit there and carry on. The worst that's going to happen to me, because we've got these phenomenal terms and conditions, is I'll get made redundant. I'll get a huge redundancy check and a fantastic delayed pension. So the systems and processes within government are simply not pulling or pushing in the same direction. So you're the chief executive of a company and you give a speech, but actually if the performance measures, your speech says X, if the performance measures say Y, you'll get Y. Um, if the reward systems say Y, uh, and actually the appraisal system is saying X, you'll tend to get Y. And so it goes on. And government is simply not aligned. Um, you can look at these other things. The health service in the UK has been under perpetual reform for 35 years. It was a fantastic service. It's now not as good as many services around continental Europe. Now, if you look at management theory and you cut costs and you restructure and you keep working the organisation harder, eventually you say, hang on, we're asking the wrong question. Actually, the problem with this business is not the costs or the structure or whatever. We've got the wrong model. And fundamentally, we've got the wrong model in the health service. Um, other things you can see there of my observations, too much and too little public expenditure. So again, I don't know whether this occurs in your country, I hope it doesn't, 
but a, a, a phenomenon, if it's a phenomenon in the UK, is that what tends to happen is that one of the parties, the Labour Party, tends to spend too much public expenditure and runs debt. The other party, the Conservative Party, then comes in and slashes the public expenditure and tends to spend too little. To the extent where I was travelling on a train in rugby in the early 90s and the train overshot the station and then had to reverse in. And, and it, was, it was sort of symptomatic that the public services had been run down so much. So we have this zigzag in government. Those countries that have proportional representation will not experience such a zigzag because of the moderating influence of uh, another party. Um, we have a civil service that believes in uh, generalism, uh, so th their, their capacity to master a brief, as it's called, is uh, uh, what they want to do. So they want to be incredibly clever, um, probably of the, off the back of a PP, PPE in Oxford University, and they can do anything. And of course, I think as we all know in this room, uh, life is specialism, specialism, specialism. I recently had uh, an injection in this wrist because I've got a bro broken bone in this wrist. Um, and the person who was treating me was a clinical um, uh, physiotherapist hand. So that was the level of specialism that she dealt with and the level I suspect you all have to deal with in the future. So those were many of my observations. But then the breakthrough point was this. If you think about governments compared with, say, charities or businesses or whatever, the absolute crucial point is they've never been designed. So there was a time when governments were being constructed according to ancient constitutional principles, uh, democracy, representative democracy, uh, human rights and the rule of law. These may sound arcane things to you all, but those are the foundations for modern government. But then you say, hang on, I mean, this is hundreds of years ago, since then, what's happened? Well, now governments are running very large public services, consuming 40% of GDP. When the constitutions were designed, they had virtually no public services, apart from the executioner. Um, they become major doers and delivers, expected to solve most problems. Well, if you go back to the Irish potato famine in uh, the 1800s, the Westminster government sort of turned around and said, well, yeah, they're all starving. I mean, what's that to do with us? And just walked away. You can't walk away from those things today. There are major industries to be regulated. There's the question of debt. Um, because we're all living so long, it becomes an intergenerational issue. So partly in this country, we have circumstances where um, civil servants particularly have unfunded index-linked pensions, which have therefore got to be paid for by future generations. Well, is that fair? A um, hundred, two hundred years ago, people didn't l live that long to mean that that was a problem. Global finance, decision complexity, you know, marauding corporates, incredibly powerful news media. And alignment has never been built into the uh, design of those constitutions. So, the task for us, the task for you, is to design a system of government which is very easy once you've been to Manchester Business School. Now, a precursor to that is the system of government goes into a constitution. And you might, most people, uh, the C word, the constitution word, um, it's rather like that other C word that we can't mention, but I don't know how this translates for you. But this C word, people tend to fall asleep. Okay, it's all terribly boring. One of the things I learnt at business school, this was at Oxford, 
is that the constitution of any organisation and the ethos of the people in it are the things that essentially drive the behaviour and the performance of that organisation. And if you're doing your projects on charities and not-for-profits, think hard about the constitution and the ethos in those organisations because they are absolutely fundamental as they are in companies. So, if you take uh, the London Olympics, which some of you may have seen, it was a very successfully run setup. A lot of people said, oh yes, yeah, that's, that's because of um, people like Sebastian Coe um, or Ken Livingstone or Tessa, who, who was the Mayor of London or the Minister and so on. It's not. Basically what happened was that um, I went and saw the IOC, the International Olympic Committee in Lausanne um, in the late 80s, I think it was, early 90s. And I said, well, look, I observe these Olympics every time. The ticketing is a mess. The transport is a mess. Indeed, such a mess that the athletes don't get to compete sometimes. Um, and something else is a mess that I can't actually remember just now. Don't you think you ought to, you know, have a look at this and pass on the knowledge? So what are we going to do? about these Olympics in order to improve them. Now, in Switzerland, they understand the power of constitution. I can explain that later, but they, they understand it. So what the IOC did, they, they didn't just pick up issues about transport and ticketing and pass on that information. What they did, they said, OK, well, now how can we make all games successful? So you have contracts. These contracts are legally binding, with serious penalties in them. They tell you the structure of the uh, delivery organisation and of the games operating companies. Um, they don't quite tell you who's going to be on them. They tell you that a condition for acquiring an Olympics and running an Olympics is the agreement of the political opposition. So it doesn't become a political football. So the reason that London was such a success, and indeed Beijing was, and the next one is, nothing to do with London per se, it's because of the constitution for running the Olympics. Um, there are other things there and uh, which I can go into at a later stage. Constitutions are key. Now, you may say, hang on, but surely it's politics, isn't it? I mean, that's what we do. We go, well, some of you will anyway. Uh, we go and vote for politicians, you know, this party or that party. And because these political parties are competing, they get better. Mm, we'll choose this lot or we'll choose that lot. There was a time when what I call heroic politics is important. This is capitalism versus socialism. Inherited justice versus social justice. All that's been done. Uh, you can argue about the margins of capitalism, but it's essentially capitalism. You can argue about the margins of social justice, but it's essentially it's social justice. It's a scoring draw. So what do we now find? The political playing field is compressed, and then you have the politicians cross-dressing. So you'll find right-wing people... Uh, doing hug a hoodie is, I don't know whether that's, but, you know, being, being nice to homeless people. Um, you'll find left-wing people saying, we need more police, and so on. Because actually the deep, deep politics has finished. And anyway, don't we all want good education, good health services, decent banking, climate chaos, effective action taken about it, etc., etc.? But politics in this country, anyway, has not delivered those things, be it left politics or right politics. And anyway, in terms of good schooling, what's left-wing and what's right-wing in it? In terms of a good banking system, what's private and what's public in terms of defined solutions, and so on. And if you have a viable system where you've narrowed and focused on what really matters, how much politics is actually left? So politics is not the answer. 
So if we bring that together, you'll find where governments fail, policy delivery. You know, I can use this pointer. Oh, look at that. So you've got policy failure. A various, all of these things are in the book if you want to get into them. What I've called dodgy delivery from age of proceduralism to managerialism. People failure, um, which is always the case, and feedback failure. We've got ancient constitutions designed for those things, but not for their modern job. So it's not surprising it's screw up. Power in the wrong places, politics in the wrong places. Democracy I'll come back to, and this is a UK-based analysis, but it applies everywhere. The, uh, the EU, the European Union, has serious problems at present, precisely because its system of government is not designed. So, we need a new design. Onward. Now, this is an indicative chart. Um, I'd very much like you to pick it up and uh, tweet it, actually. Um, that would be really good if some of you would. Um, but I, I reckon it's something like this. I mean, take your own view. But if you think about consumer uh, technology, you know, since then, mobile phone, internet, smartphones, video games, internet, etc., etc. This this may be an understatement of the benefit, particularly when you think about what do we mean by performance. At the same time, you know, how's, how's your government price performance? Well, actually, I'm, certainly ours is going down, and that's not a political statement, it's just going down, uh, because they've got so governed up. So you then say, OK, well, why is that happening? And this is the absolute nub for me, that if you take a national industry or an international industry, if you go back to the Japanese invasion of the US with first the motorcycle and secondly the motor car in the early 80s, it was like uh, this new thing had hit the US because these cars didn't break down. Uh, they were reliable and they came fitted with all sorts of things. And the US car industry and a lot of the uh, US business schools and gurus sort of step back and what the hell's going on here? Uh, how do they do it? And great, so they went off and learned. We went off and talked to them and they went off and understood. Basic, uh, not basic things, at the time clever things like total quality management, just in time, integrated supply chains, which is where all these things came from. So that if you're in consumer electronics now in manufacturing, unless you're world class, then you're not in business. But how does that happen? Well, if you think about it, um, we have all of this knowledge sharing mechanism. So you've got, and you can read this in Michael Porter's book, for example, The Competitive Advantage of Nations. So you've got trade associations, um, you've got professional institutes, I'm not quite sure what that's doing there, but you know, it probably was doing something useful. You've got, this is universities. I was thinking about the film schools in California, which are an integral part of the success of the Hollywood uh, film industry. Um, you've got uh, trade magazines. You've got things like the FT. And then on an international basis, th this is a management guru. Does anyone recognise him? Um, I think... He's possibly, um, he's not, he's, is he Michael Porter? No. Anyway, you've got international gurus going around. You've got firms, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who are part of that learning knowledge, McKinsey and all the rest of them. This is software, that's more software, INSEAD and so on. So you've got these massive learning engines. Now, why don't we do the same for governments? Why aren't governments learning one from the other? They're underperforming. A lot of them are mired in gridlock politics. You, you don't have to watch House of Cards uh, to understand how bad it is in the States. A lot of people are feeling disin 
disenchanted, disenfranchised, disengaged. So there's a major challenge and opportunity for people like yourselves to sort this out. But the same old thinking is not going to work it. So constitutional studies, political studies, democracy, these are the homes for sorting out government. Well, they haven't done it, I'm afraid. So the key, as I think I've explained, is organisation theory. I think also if you take a fresh analytic frame, then we can find that that leads to the breakthroughs that we're looking for. You have to look at systems as a whole, and this has not been done before. I think I've covered most of these points, apart from the last one, which is it's time for Manchester Business School to enter this market and become a major disruptive influence in the way in which governments are looked at. I think I've covered that as well. So, this is a viable system of government. This is the treaty for government. This is how it should work. And I'll pick out those points. You can have the slides and see these afterwards. But I'll pick out those, uh, some key points about uh, how this can work. So if you imagine you're in government and basically you do stuff but you never find out if it works. Now, you know, that's pretty bloody hopeless. Can you imagine a company, you know, you do stuff, you chuck it out there, and you never know whether it works or not. So, what do we need? Well, if you've got legislation, regulation, statutory duties, policies, programmes, does it work? What was the result? I've got a programme for, uh, I've passed a piece of legislation for the legislation of handguns following the Dunblane ma massacre. Well, I was in favour of that piece of legislation. Does it work? How much does it cost? You produce a lead table of all the legislation and then you start to chip away at all of that legislation that doesn't work. You apply the same uh, incisive and ruthless approach to policies and programmes and you look at whether they're working and you say, well, actually, it may have been a good idea, but I'm terribly sorry it's not working anymore, so we'll have an abandonment programme and we'll get rid of it. You look at government bodies and uh, I would like to see TripAdvisor applied to government bodies. Okay, so imagine your tax authorities, you know, and you've just filled in your tax return and you can go on and you can fill out a trip advisor or your experience with the health service or your experience with getting a driving licence or your experience in filling in a form. So that these people never get decent feedback from, from us. If you're going to do all of that feedback, you then need to... Uh, have a place that's going to do it. Self-scoring politicians that say, yes, everything is wonderful, all is well. It's not terribly helpful. You need independent. And that, for me, means a fourth separation of powers in what I've called the resulture, which um, then has to be itself in an independent place, which has to be the second chamber, which I would therefore put into the uh, uh, second, uh, sec into that what we call the House of Lords. What about decision taking? Uh, currently, if you're a politician, you can actually take a decision pretty much any way you want. There'll be some checks and balances in uh, the process as it goes through uh, the, the first and second chamber, in our case, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. But in general, you can take any decision you want. Well, what have you learnt about decision-taking? What have you learnt about what makes a good decision? Well, in terms of my experience, these are the ten things you need to know. First of all, you're about to pass a propose a piece of legislation. Well, what's its point? You know, what is the point of a particular law. Laws, certainly in this country, don't have to say 
why they're being put forward. Secondly, consumer strategy. So I did some work uh, on domestic violence. So this is a particularly unpleasant thing. We did a consumer strategy with, uh, well, victims and indeed perpetrators of domestic violence. Now, you sit there and you think, well, why? Usually a woman can be a man, but why does a woman stay with a man who's hitting her? You know, this is, and they would come in and, I mean, they've been hit. I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear. So why? And then you find out that actually, well, what's the state going to give in return? Well, the state will give potentially uh, criminalising and sending to jail your husband, partner, who you love, criminalising and sending to jail the father of your children, and if you're really lucky, they'll take your children into care. Those are the actualities of what happens in this country in relation to domestic violence. So what does the woman or the man do? Well, I think I'll continue to be hit, thank you very much. None of that information gets into government unless they develop policy from the consumers, the citizens. I think if you're going to, and again this will apply to you very much as consultants, you, you need to develop that capacity as you consult to understand how an organisation works, so what I call the insider test. So the insider test is essentially saying, uh, can I either get someone who's inside a bank or an organisation, or can I apply my skills as a consultant to working out how to grasp what's going on in that organisation. Very few politicians and civil servants have that. The delivery test, how are you going to deliver your policy and so on? Oh, what's it going to cost? Um, I think what I'll do here is just pick out the public sector duties. So if you're working in the public sector, I think there should be duties. And these are one of the things that we're trying to put in place in order to, if you like, mimic some of the imperatives that uh, just happen in the market sector, in the competitive sector, because of competitive pressures. Okay, so I think these should be statutory, and I think they should uh, uh, be on everyone who works in the public sector. So, and I mean, let me know if you disagree, but you know, first of all, there's a duty not to deliver procedures, but to deliver results, um, to minimise costs, um, to deliver within the whole of the public sector, i.e. not within silos, um, to balance power with uh, citizens and consumers rather than it being, we're the public sector and we're doing this to you. Um, to speak straight, I don't know how many of you travel on trains, but I get really annoyed when uh, at half term, when the schools are off, uh, when the announcement comes over the tannoy that the reason the train is so busy and you haven't got a seat is because it's half term. Well, Virgin Trains knew that it was half term at least a year ago. Actually, they knew it was half term two years ago. What I would like to hear them say is that the reason the train is so full and you haven't got a seat is because we don't want to spend money putting on extra carriages and the reason we don't want to spend money is because we want to make more profits. That's understandable. The reason we're allowed to do that is because the Department for Transport have given us such a slack contract and the people who are running that contract are so bloody useless at running contracts that we can get away with it. That's what I mean by speaking straight. And if you start to get some honesty into these relationships and some transparency, uh, then we will start to get some change. And abandon the interfective. I think also in the public sector we need to apply best organisational practice, which is what you're learning here. I've picked up four things there. 
um, alignment, benchmarking, proven concepts, and what I call real local government. Fit people. I'll just pick out a couple of things here, because I should say the reason I'm here is because of Pete Barra here, who um, was in business school for a long, long time, indeed did his MBA here, and was dean and deputy director for a long time, and he's provided me with this introduction. And we were talking about the number of people uh, that we've come across in our careers, heads of this, directors of that, head teachers of schools, who are just stuck in those roles, and we're just waiting to leave them out. And eventually we shift them over and stick them into a role um, which we hope will keep them quiet. And this is, uh, sorry, where am I? Yeah, uh, one of the points about limited terms of office, anyone in the lead role should be up for assessment every four years automatically rather than the other way round. That should also apply to prime ministers as it does for example, in the US, you get two terms of four years, that's it. And I can assure you, for anyone, that's more than enough. After that, they tend to go uh, mad, um, or they tend to uh, get uh, delusions of grandeur and power, and you really don't want people hanging around for longer than that. Um, those of you... you probably not that familiar with our civil service, but it essentially has been under reform and has never been reformed since 1967. Um, it's still pretty much of a mess. Th there are aspects of the civil service which are really, really good, which is about political, parliamentary, legislative administration, and they should carry on doing that. Uh, but otherwise, we need to go much more towards those countries that have systems where essentially the politicians choose the people, have the capacity to choose and the right to choose people to deliver. Um, sorry, where have I gone? Competitive democracy. So governments are uh, and political parties are as influenced by competition as anyone else. Um, Proportional voting, changing prime minister, funding political parties. I mean, this is just dreadful in the US and sort of bad here. You get this incredible distortions in competition. And, and competition and democracy are very closely related. And so you have to have equal funding or fair funding of political parties. Um, right to referendum, I, I won't get into that, but they're particularly important and powerful uh, direct democracy in Switzerland uh, and the way in which that's applied and it brings more competition into the system. Finally, I think I've talked about that and it's not just about a system because the system is intended to deliver many more right decisions, uh, taxes that are a fair and because you've eliminated a lot of waste, are lower, or you can redistribute them and use them for much more productive things. Um, proportionate wealth and income, rather than the huge distortions we're getting. Just our everyday lives being easier because the way in which government interacts with us and the services delivered uh, are much better. People feeling part of decisions, power being redistributed, and certainly in this country, a world without sleaze, um, ineffectual politics, and you know all of those mind-numbing adversarial TV interviews that we get. I mean, it's what I call Renaissance government, and I think it's perfectly possible. It depends on the application of stuff you're learning. Um, and I'd like us to get on with it as quickly as possible. Um, as I say, uh, it's all in the book. You'll, if you haven't picked up a copy, you're very welcome to take a copy. Um, and I think it's now time for questions and answers. Thank you. Wondering, in your opinion, in 
you know, the UK is the issue with um, civil service is does that does the blame for the situation that it's in is that more with the civil service itself or with the, the government and where you have kind of a you know yes minister situation where you yeah. Um, well, as you know, yes, minister, the thick of it. Have you ever seen? No. I haven't seen that. No. Okay. House of Cards. Um, all of these programs, you may think they're uh, dramas. They're not. They are reality television. Okay. So, okay, you know, House of Cards. Uh, politicians tend not to murder people usually, but the rest of it, this is reality TV. I did a report for Demos, the think tank, in uh, 2006 on the civil service and its reform. And uh, it argued for, for quite a lot of change within the civil service. However, the problem is that because of the way we have a system of government in this country, the executive, the government, has an awful lot of power. Um, at present, the civil service is notionally responsible for delivery, for getting things done. So if you take power away from the civil service, which is what I was proposing, you put more power into the government. So a lot of people are going, hang on, you know, because it's even more concentrated in the UK than it is in the US. You're giving more power to the executive. This is a really bad idea. I then realised that uh, you can't reform the civil service in isolation from the whole system. So if you're then saying, OK, we've now got a fourth and fifth separation of powers, uh, in particular you've got feedback, which is on results, which is a discipline on the civil service, on the government, on the public services, and indeed on us as electors, so you've taken power and you've put that in a result chair. You've taken power and put that in to uh, the policy vetting. Then you can say, OK, now the executive doesn't have too much power, so now we can reform the civil service and make the politicians responsible for delivery, and basically they can do what they want. So to answer your question, it's the lot of them. And the problem is that, of course, when you've got a systemic problem, people within the system either don't see it or, you know, the classic, a turkey's going to vote for Christmas, uh, which by and large they don't. Um, so, which is why it needs external scrutiny, I think, to change it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kush from India. Um, in your talk, you were talking about um, that in the UK you have an inefficient secondary school system. Yeah. Right? And um, the health services have been in reform uh, for the last 35 years. Yeah. And these are two of the most basic uh, needs of yes. the common people, right? Yes. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the government knows that. Uh, in, in fact, every government knows that, right? Yeah. And uh, it's still after that, why do you think that uh, you know, the governments are failing on this? Yeah. Continuously, again, you know, each yeah. government after each. Okay. Is that because of you know, too little public expenditure or some other wrong model that they've taken? No. Uh, well, I mean, uh, right, okay. That's a very good question. Um, so, so, take the schools first of all. In most countries, secondary schooling is not a political football. In this country, it is. Uh, so, you'll have one party saying, do this and the other party saying do this, and it's been like that for years and years and years. Most countries are sensible, because as you say, I mean, not only is secondary schooling a basic need, we all have a collective interest in everyone getting educated as best they can, because if everyone is educated, then people are uh, tax positive, they're employable, and so on. It's a collective good. Because of our first-past-the-post system, uh, it means essentially there is only a choice between two parties. Um, so we don't have proportional representation, if that makes sense. So you've got two parties, and into that becomes, uh, we've got a problem with schools, so, oh, we have this solution. And, oh, no, we have this solution. It's a better solution. No, no, we have this solution. 
With proportional voting, you would get people saying, look, for goodness sake, we need to agree on the solution. So, you know, Germany or France or Italy, uh, that, that's, that's the way it works. The health service is exactly the same. It, it was a fantastic construction by the Labour Party, so by one of the parties. So the Labour Party are terribly pleased with their construction and it can never be changed because it's a shining example of what we've done. The Conservative Party are not trusted with the health service because they've always opposed it. Um, although, uh, and so they'll try and reform it by the back door. Okay, we've got a problem with the health service, it's not working terribly well. Your MBA is what would you do? Well, personally, I've seen there's one in France, that seems to work quite well. Uh, one in Germany, that seems to work quite well. There's one in Italy, that seems to work quite well. Let's kind of have a look at them, shall we? And see how they work. And then, of course, we've got to engage the public because you can't make that bigger shift by simply saying, right, OK, that's what we're going to do, you know, put up with it. You've got to, and that's exactly what they did in Canada in 2003. Had a, had a huge public engagement program that was saying to people, look, we've got a problem. You know, Medicaid, uh, insurance based, da 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 da. And they came out with an answer. So, yeah, that's the response to that one. Do you know why uh, the Italian approach to road safety? I was once told by a professor of sociology. <coughs> Italian approach to road safety? Build bigger hospitals. <laughs> my name is Leticia. I'm from Brazil. And my question is about the feedback system that you proposed. Yeah. So you talk about a feedback system uh, regarding legislation. Yeah. Uh, and that you kind of mentioned the trip advisor thing about the public services. Yeah. Would this feedback system also be applied to the executive power? Uh, because you also suggested a four-year term for executive power. Mm. How would this feedback monitor the executive? It, it, in the sense of the... Okay, so you just help me a little bit here. So, so you've got the government. Yeah, you have yeah. the president in some countries. Yeah, so yes, how yes. How would you monitor the during this four years? Yeah, um, well, uh, everything... I mean, there, there may be things that are terribly secret in foreign policy, yeah, and, you know, conflict in Syria, yeah, okay. So there are some very sensitive things. But by and large, uh, secrecy is the enemy of success. Yeah, I mean, it's been a big, big problem. So uh, we need to see, um, you know, what decisions are you taking? Well, I mean, yes, that happens now. Um, why are you taking them? <laughs> you know, what, what is the aim? What's the purpose? What's the point? And then the resulture, the fourth separation of powers, comes back and says, OK, this is what happened. You know, you, you aim to do this and you've done that. And a lot of this system is about um, bringing in intelligence to government and to democracy. It's about the distribution of power, because by and large, having uh, a soup, you know, have dictators, you know, are really bad news. You know, they don't work well. <laughs> organizationally, uh, leave democracy aside, organizationally, you know, they don't have a good, uh, a good record. So we want collective power. Um, so, so I would see, uh, in terms of the monitoring of uh, the executive, well, they, they, you know, the whole feedback system at the end of the day um, would incorporate monitoring of them, unless I've missed your point. Yes, um, my, my concern is just in terms of uh, political instability. If you constantly feedback them, would they have, for example, if they have a negative feedback, what would be the punishment for that just after the four years? Ah, um, well, I, sp I suppose we could, you know, publicly flog them. Um, or, oh, no, it's a bad idea. Um, the, no, I think this, this is not about 
punishments in that sense. This is about learning. This is about a system that says, look, we're all in this together. It's about a change of mindset. It's not about appointing someone or electing someone and that person then seeking to cling on to power and seeking to spin and lie and obfuscate the results so that you know we the public don't know what's going on. That's about saying, no, look, you did this and that worked. Brilliant. Let's all be adult about this though. You did this and that didn't work. I mean, Christ, this applies you know, to me as much as anyone else. Um, uh, you did that and we sort of don't know yet. Um, you did that and actually this is where the experimentation needs to come in. That was an experiment and, and it's, it's perfectly acceptable for an experiment to fail. Um, so it's about, yeah, how, think about how you would like an organisation to work that you were running. Um, and that's, I think, basically how a government minister should work, yeah. Hi, my name is Bishal from India. Actually, just to build up on the question of feedback. So, like, in the current scenario, we have, like, media, like BBC News, yeah. newspaper, that two times. So, so they're always analysing the yeah. government, you know, yeah. in terms of how they're doing, what yeah. they're doing, the yeah. articles. So is that not a sufficient, you know, feedback? Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, problem with news media is they're all running their own agendas, yeah. Um, the problem also is their assessment of whether something has worked uh, is often inaccurate or wrong, or, or simply uh, they bought some spin, you know, they bought a line from somewhere or other. Um, the point about the resulture uh, is that it's independent uh, scorekeeping and it's there to be accurate and precise. Um, I mean, I find I've done a lot of work with news media over the years and, and I find even the BBC, <laughs> I'm afraid to say, they don't, they don't particularly lie. They're just not particularly accurate or precise. I mean, I listened to the, the Today program. The, the Today program is that meaningful in uh, the mornings, and the standard of debate is is so abysmally low. I mean, these people have apparently been educated. Um, so, uh, no is the answer to your question. These these assessments are, are far more complicated than any newspaper or television channel would uh, be able to grasp. I mean, sometimes they get things right, but, but it's often a long way afterwards. You know, they'll uncover something or find something out. But by and large, um, I'm afraid not. Uh, right, let's take three very quickly, because I'm conscious that, uh, yep. Yeah. You mentioned that experience leads to frustration, to frustration to solutions. How hard is this solution to implement? And because yeah. we're facing the same problem with our NFT projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, uh, another one. There were two more questions. I, st I thought I. Well, just take this one. And the, sorry, I've not been very good about getting people back. Take this one and that one, and then we'll have to. Hello. My name is Francisco, I'm from Uruguay. Uh, many projects have failed because the different parties didn't agree on what to do. Yeah. In your experience, what would be the best way to get to a consensus and an agreement between different parties? Yeah, uh, it's a good one. And one, one at the back, yeah. Hello, my name is Federico, and also I'm from Colombia. Yeah. Uh, my question is, when, when I saw that you were coming, the first thing that came into my mind you were talking about it was bureaucracy and uh, and uh, corruption. Uh, you didn't mention that very much in the speech. Is that uh, because some specific reason? Um, well, the answer to that is simply uh, simple. That that I mean, simply time. Um, that there is bureaucracy and corruption in our system. Uh, I, I would happily go into it in more detail. Um, and. All of the solution that I propose 
uh, or, or much of the solution I propose uh, would have considerable impact on, on decimating bureaucracy and in stopping corruption. Uh, so uh, that's easy. In that, sorry, easy, <laughs> <laughs> an easy answer. Sorry, in that in that sense. Um, okay, if you try and make decisions uh, in, yeah, sorry, if you try and make decisions in the absence of information, uh, you get a lot of politics. Oh, I think this. No, oh, I think this. Well, you know, the right thing to, you know, it's all those beliefs, these ideologies and all the rest of it. The more, and this is, you know, what's the benefit of planning? There was a famous thing, uh, the benefit of scenario, on Harvard Business Review years ago, benefit of scenario planning. It's not actually that the plan works out. It's that actually you've thought about it and you've narrowed your space. So um, getting information, real information in, will help the consensus. A, B, um, proportional representation, where you have more than two conflicting parties. You have moderating parties. And C, I built into uh, one of the ways in which you make policy is public engagement. Um, and I'm afraid, given the time, you'll have to read up on public engagement, but i uh, happily speak to you afterwards. <laughs>